Hi, I'm the History Guy. I have a degree in history and I love history, and if you love history too, this is the channel for you. 112 years ago today, on December 30th, 1905, retired former Idaho Governor Frank Stunenberg went for a walk around his neighborhood in Caldwell, Idaho, through nearly 10 inches of December snow. As he strolled that frigid December morning, you can imagine that, like millions of others, that he was thinking about the possibilities for the new year. When he returned home, he opened the side gate to his yard, and it exploded. While he was gone, someone had rigged the gate with several sticks of dynamite. Blown nearly 10 feet in the air, the governor was grievously injured and died in his home later that day. The assassination of Frank Stunenberg made national headlines in its day, and the trial that followed a national sensation included some of the most famous advocates of the day arguing over one of the most contentious issues facing the young nation. It is a story of the wildest part of the Wild West, and a part of the nation's history that many people would rather forget. And yet this now nearly forgotten political assassination deserves to be remembered. As much as we think of the West in terms of cowboys and Indians, outlaws and lawmen, and settlers crossing the nation in their covered wagons, the history of development in the American West was actually largely driven by minerals. The discovery of gold in California in 1849, the famed Gold Rush, drove the westward expansion and the overall development of the United States perhaps more than any other single event. The California Gold Rush was followed by many more, from the Black Hills of South Dakota to Tombstone, Arizona to the Alaskan Klondike. Many U.S. Western states, including Nevada, Colorado, Idaho, Arizona, Montana, North and South Dakota, and Alaska, were originally settled not by farmers, but by miners and prospectors. And while many of those miners headed west hoping to strike their fortune, the vast majority ended up working in a profession that was dangerous, grueling, and where power was concentrated in the hands of the mine owners. Attempts to unionize labor in the American mining industry began as early as the 1860s, although early attempts tended to be short-lived responses to specific complaints. In response, mine owners formed mine owners associations intended to protect the interests of the mining companies. A seminal event in the escalating conflict was a labor strike in Coeur Idaho in 1892. The central labor complaint had to do with automation replacing miners and reducing wages, but the situation escalated when it was discovered that the Mine Owners Association had infiltrated the miners' union with a detective, allowing the mine owners to outmaneuver many of the union's plans. The use of these so-called labor spies, in this case a detective from the famous Pinkerton agency named Charlie Syringo, was a particular bone of contention. The discovery of the labor spy led to a violent confrontation with striking miners exchanging gunfire with mine guards and replacement workers called strike breakers. Three people were killed and 17 injured in the violence. In response, Idaho Governor Norman Bushnell Wiley declared martial law, deploying both troops of the Idaho National Guard and later federal troops. Many union members were confined without formal charges in the four months of martial law. The heavy-handed response resulted in the formation of a new, better organized, and more militant union organization called the Western Federation of Miners. The WFM would then play a central role in the many violent mining labor disputes in the United States and Canada in the latter part of the 19th and early part of the 20th centuries. The WFM led strikes in Cripple Creek, Colorado in 1894 and Leadville, Colorado in 1896, both of which resulted in the deployment of the Colorado National Guard. While the former was largely successful in achieving its goals, the latter was not, and resulted in an evolution into a smaller, more radically socialist, and more violent WFM. This would set the stage for another labor dispute in Coeur d'Alene in 1899. In 1896, Idaho had elected a new governor, a former newspaper editor named Frank Stunenberg. The 36-year-old Stunenberg had won the nomination for both the Democratic and the Populist Party, and had won the election on the back of significant union support. He was the first Idaho governor who was not a Republican, and mining company fears that he would not support them in a labor dispute was enough to cause them to raise wages. He easily won election to another two-year term in 1898. But trouble flared in 1899. The Western Federation of Miners was having a dispute with two mining operations that chose to pay a lower wage and operate only with non-union miners. The WFM perceived these two mining operations to be a threat to their wage scale. On April 29, 1899, union members from the WFM used nearly 3,000 pounds of dynamite to destroy a mill belonging to the Bunker Hill Mine. So much dynamite was needed that the union men commandeered a train at gunpoint to move it all. The mill contained a huge concentrator used to refine ore into silver. In the blast, the WFM destroyed the most expensive piece of mining equipment in the United States, worth more than a quarter million dollars at the time. 
the local sheriff supported the Union and did nothing to prevent the violence. Shocked by the extent of the damage and the lawlessness, Stunenberg appealed to President William McKinley for federal troops, declaring Shoshone County, where the event had occurred, to be in a state of insurrection and rebellion. Once again, martial law was declared. The response was heavy-handed, including indiscriminate arrests where hundreds of men were herded into so-called bullpens without trial or the right of habeas corpus. Some were held in inhuman conditions for as much as a year. Politicians sympathetic to the Union cause were arrested. Newspapers critical of the federal response were closed down. The power of the WFM in the area was broken. One of the Union supporters was convicted of murder in the death of one of the Bunker Hill employees, and several were convicted of the federal crime of interfering with the mail for the abduction of the train used to carry the dynamite. For his action declaring martial law, Stunenberg was seen as a traitor by the unions that had helped to elect him. He did not seek re-election in 1900, but enmity against him clearly remained. Five years later, when he was killed by the booby trap on his gate, the WFM immediately fell under suspicion in the assassination. Two days after the explosion, January 1st, 1906, a suspect was arrested. The man, named Harry Orchard, had been staying at a local hotel. A waitress reported that he had acted suspiciously on the day of the bombing. A search of his hotel room found further evidence that he had made the bomb. The lead investigator, a famous Pinkerton detective named James McParland, convinced Orchard that he would be better off if he became a witness for the state. Orchard then told an astounding tale. Not only had he killed Governor Stunenberg, but he admitted to 17 other murders, all at the behest, he claimed, of the leadership of the Western Federation of Miners. The trial of WFM leader Big Bill Haywood, held in 1907, was one of the most dramatized of the day, called by the press the greatest trial of modern time. One question regarding the mine leader's arrest in Colorado went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. The prosecution included future U.S. Senator William Bora, and the WFM leaders were represented by the legendary attorney Clarence Darrow. After nearly a three-month trial, Haywood was acquitted, largely because Orchard's testimony could not be corroborated. In the end, only Harry Orchard was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. The trials of the three WFM leaders in the assassination of Frank Stunenberg ended up being sort of a watershed in the American labor movement. While the trials themselves offered plenty of drama and there were accusations of misconduct on both sides, they ended up being sort of trials on the idea of organized labor in the United States. And the acquittals represented not just the fact that the jurors could objectively appreciate facts, but also showed the growing sympathy for the populist movement in the Western United States. Still, there are many who argued that the jurors were intimidated, that they were afraid that their families would face violence if they convicted. And to this day, there's still disagreement over whether the WFM was involved in Stunenberg's murder. Ironically, the acquittals might have represented sort of a death knell for the radical tactics of the WFM. Exhausted after years of violent confrontations, including the notorious Colorado Labor Wars in 1903 and 1904, labor had soured on violent tactics. And the acquittals themselves showed that labor members could get fair trials in the United States, which itself undercut much of the rationalization that was used to justify those violent tactics. In embracing more radical socialism had alienated many of the former allies of the WFM, and so by the 1910s, the Western Federation of Miners had lost its position as a leading voice in the labor movement in the Western United States. In 1916, they changed their name to the International Union of Mine, Mill, and Smelter Workers and enjoyed a brief resurgence in the 1930s and 1940s, but their association with socialism cost them during the Red Scare of the 1950s. And finally, with declining influence, they merged with the Steel Workers Union in 1967. Harry Orchard was sentenced to life in prison for the murder and died in the Idaho State Penitentiary in 1954 at the age of 88. He maintained throughout his life that his confession and implication of the WFM leadership was true. Big Bill Haywood's fame in the labor movement grew after his acquittal. He eventually split with the WFM as the union moved away from more radical socialism and aligned himself with the Industrial Workers of the World, which he had helped to found. In 1918, he and over a hundred other members of the IWW were arrested under the Espionage Act for instigating a labor strike during wartime. Facing up to 30 years in prison, he skipped bail and fled to Russia, where he became an ally of the Bolsheviks. He died in Russia in 1928. The once trial of the century has largely faded from the national memory, as has the period of violent labor confrontations at the turn of the 20th century. And yet, that period, when violence was common on both sides, represented significant changes in American culture and law, and established the industrial labor movement in the United States. 
And for that reason alone, that assassination of Frank Stenenberg on a frigid December morning in 1905 deserves to be remembered. I'm the History Guy, and I hope you enjoyed this edition of my series, Five Minutes of History, short snippets of forgotten history, five to ten minutes long. And if you did enjoy it, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button, which is there on your left. If you have any questions or comments or would like to make a topic suggestion for the History Guy, feel free to write those in the comment section. I will be happy to respond. If you'd like five minutes more of history, all you need to do is subscribe.